your interpretation of Donald Trump's pre-debate media tour of complaints and excuses. <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much for having me, Jonathan. Listen, I think this is what we've come to expect from Donald Trump uh, when it comes to debates, right? This is a guy who has a history of complaining about debates, uh, skipping out on debates, uh, trying to use them as spectacle for his advantage. I think the problem for Donald Trump, though, is when he takes the stage, the American people are going to see uh, the fundamental choice in this election. They're going to see on one side of the stage, President Biden, who's fighting relentlessly for the American people to bring people together to get things done. And on the other side, they're going to see Donald Trump, who's waging a campaign of grievance, uh, who's only in it for himself, and is making it clear every single day on the stump, as Senator Warren pointed out, just how extreme he would be in a second term. Uh, so that's the choice that's, that the American people are going to be confronted with when they tune in on Thursday night, regardless of what Trump tries to do on the front end here. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, speaking of on the front end, ahead of the debate, the Trump campaign is holding a black American business leaders barbershop roundtable. Now, Donald Trump says he's making inroads with black voters and polls do show Trump ahead in Georgia. But I seem to recall when I traveled with you and the president down to uh, Atlanta just after the State of the Union address back on March 9th, we went to a black owned business. So I'm just wondering, how does the how does the Biden Harris campaign see Georgia? Yeah, well, we see Georgia as uh, incredibly competitive. Uh, the president obviously won the state of Georgia in 2020, and we expect to do so again. It's going to be incredibly close and competitive, but we know that we have the right candidate and the right team in place uh, to get the votes and win the state of Georgia again. I think if you want to talk about black voters and black business, for example, I'm not quite sure why Donald Trump will, wants to uh, talk about black business, because we know by the end of his term, black businesses were shuttered uh, because of the way that he fumbled the COVID response. He was telling us to inject bleach instead of doing his job. And the result Result was uh, black people left disproportionately dead and black businesses disproportionately shuttered. I think the only things that actually went up by the end of Donald Trump's first term for black America were the unemployment rate and the uninsured rate. Uh, so we're happy to wage uh, this campaign on that front. If you put that up against the president's historic record of accomplishment uh, for, for black America, uh, record low black unemployment in the first term, uh, black wealth growing by 60 percent since before the pandemic, the fastest rate of black small business growth in a generation, historic investments in the HBCUs, the tune of $16 billion. Uh, that is a choice uh, that's going to be easy for black America to make in this election. And we're confident that if we continue to communicate uh, that contrast of visions, uh, that contrast of values, uh, that we're going to win this election, uh, both in Georgia and across the country, of course. Michael, let's look at another key state. Uh, in, in a recent interview, Jenna Malley Dillon, chair of the Biden-Harris re-election campaign, said, quote, What's happening in North Carolina, the extreme laws that are moving through the state legislature, a restrictive abortion law there, there that's worse than most other places in the country, a beyond extreme candidate running for governor in Mark Robinson. If you put all those pieces together, we really see that the state is in play. So, Michael, North Carolina will begin to mail absentee ballots starting on September 6th. So this might be the only debate North Carolina voters see. What will it take to flip North Carolina? Yeah, North Carolina is absolutely in play. Uh, I think if you want to look at any indicator of that, look exactly where the president is going after he leaves Atlanta. Uh, we're going directly to rally North Carolina uh, to organize and rally uh, our growing grassroots army in the Tar Heel State. We know uh, that given everything that you just described, the demographic makeup, the extremism that's been on display uh, in, uh, in, in the state legislature there, obviously the extreme MAGA candidate that they have uh, in the state of North Carolina, uh, in many ways it's a microcosm of what we're looking at across the country here. And so we we know uh, that if we uh, relentlessly engage in the state of North Carolina, uh, that we're going to be able to come out on top. That's true in Georgia. It's true in North Carolina. Uh, it's, of course, true in the blue wall states as well. We know uh, that we have the resources, the candidate, the message, the vision and the values uh, to win across the country here. And that's the type of campaign that we are building. We've got 300 uh, field offices open across the country. We have over a thousand staff now on the ground across all the battleground states. And so that's true in North Carolina. It's true in Georgia. And I think it stands in stark contrast uh, to the lack of an operation that the Trump team has at this stage of race. We know in an incredibly polarized and divided electorate uh, where you have two candidates that are both widely well known, the operations that you have in place matter that much more. And there's only one campaign at this stage of the race uh, that is actually doing the work to reach the voters that are deciding the election. Every dollar that people chip in when they go to JoeBiden.com is, is fueling that grassroots army that we are building in the battlegrounds across the country. So uh, we're foot on the gas coming off of the debate in Atlanta. We'll be on in North Carolina and across the battleground states from here.
Well, you mentioned earlier blue wall states, so let's talk about one of them. I want you to listen to what a Pennsylvania voter told NBC News today. I'm looking to uh, see that uh, uh, Joe Biden does the, uh, you know, accentuates what he's already done and, and to uh, really say this is this is my plan to improve that. So what will Joe Biden, President Biden, say about his plan to build upon his record in the next four years? Yeah, listen, I think you'll hear a lot of that on Thursday night, right? He'll talk about the historic record of accomplishment, everything from 15 million uh, jobs created since the day he took office, 800,000 of those being manufacturing jobs, the work that he's done to lower costs uh, for American people, capping the cost of insulin at 35 bucks for our seniors, for example. But he'll increasingly talk about the work uh, that we're going to accomplish in a second term, beginning with restoring Roe v. Wade as the law of the land. He'll talk about continuing to lower costs for Americans, expanding that $35 insulin cap to all Americans in a second term, uh, expanding the $2,000 out-of-pocket prescription drug cap to all Americans in a second term, are continuing to add more medications uh, uh, to uh, Medicare negotiation, for example, continuing the work that we're going to do to make sure that we actually live in a country with a fair tax code so that a billionaire never pays less in taxes than a school teacher and a nurse, and making sure that we understand that if Donald Trump is elected, none of that is going to happen, right? We're only going to have a more dark, uh, dangerous, and chaotic vision for where he wants to take the country. He's going to get on that stage and talk about the fact that he thinks the extreme state-level abortion ban uh, that he's responsible for or playing out brilliantly. He's going to make it clear that he's comfortable uh, with more abortion bans playing out across the country if he's able to regain power. He's going to talk about more uh, corporate handouts and tax giveaways to the ultra wealthy on the backs of the middle class if he's able to regain power. And he's going to wage his campaign of, of revenge and retribution from the debate stage, continuing to attack democracy, par promising to pardon the insurrectionists of January 6th. That's the fundamental contrast that the American people are going to see on that debate stage. And they're going to see through the duration of this campaign moving forward. Well, Michael, Trump often uses the phrases Biden, Biden migrant crime when talking about immigration. He'll likely use that phrase on Thursday. But the question is, how will the president re respond if he does it? <laughs> yeah, listen, I mean, Donald Trump, there's no tragedy that Donald Trump won't try to exploit for his own personal gain. Uh, obviously, every last one of these is a tragedy. Uh, we understand that the president understand that. But we're not going to let Donald Trump uh, misconstrue the facts. The fact of the matter is that crime went up under Donald Trump's presidency. Crime is down under Joe Biden's presidency. Uh, Donald Trump doesn't care about crime. He doesn't care about border security. I think that's evident by the fact that he's the one who blew up the border security deal when we had a Biden bipartisan deal in the Senate. With the president, you have somebody who's actually trying to bring people together relentlessly uh, to fix our problems. That's true of border security. That's true of every challenge that the American people face. And so that's, again, a fundamental contrast that the American people are going to see on the debate stage on Thursday night. One more question for you, M Michael. Uh, Donald Trump will surely try to exploit Democratic divisions over the war in Gaza. How will President Biden put the focus back on what Trump's policies would mean for Palestinians? Yeah, I think Donald Trump makes it very clear uh, that he would not make life better for Palestinians or Americans or anybody, for that matter. I think what the president is going to do is make sure that the American people understand that they elected him precisely because he does not view uh, issues of global security through the lens of politics. He views them as the commander in chief. That's what he's been doing uh, in the Middle East. Uh, that's why the American people elected him in the first place. And that's why they'll reelect him in November, because he is actually doing his job. He does not view these issues through the lens of what's in it, what's best for him and himself. That's obviously what Donald Donald Trump does, and that stands in stark contrast uh, to the president who the American people elected. Michael, I lied. I have one. This is the last question. <laughs> I'm sorry. This is the last question. What will success look like Thursday night? Listen, I think success is the American people having a clear understanding of the choice in this election, because that's exactly what they'll see uh, when these two candidates take the stage. They will walk away from the debate seeing a president in Joe Biden who is fighting relentlessly for the American people to get things done for them. And across from that, they'll see Donald Trump, who's increasingly unhinged, who's running a campaign now as a convicted felon, uh, who's convicted precisely because he was willing to do or say anything to gain and hold on to power and is now uh, promising to enact revenge and retribution if he's able to regain power. Uh, that's what the American people are going to walk away from uh, after they've watched the debate on Thursday night. Hey there, MSNBC fans. I'm Luke Russert, and be sure to join me, Rachel Maddow, Jen Psaki, 
Lawrence O'Donnell, Steve Kornacki, Joy Reid, and many more. September 7th in Brooklyn, MSNBC Live Democracy 2024. Click on the link for ticket information. We will see you there.